We're, we're gonna we're gonna start now. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, we're happy to have all of our council here together again, and we'll uh, we'll for the record uh, state who we are. We'll start over here. Keith Bradshaw. Chris Simonson. Kendallin Harris. Randy Lewis. Millie Segurabar. Richard Higginson. Thank you, and all of those who are here from staff, and for those who just came to participate, uh, watch and uh, uh, listen. Uh, we're glad that you're, that you're here, thank you. Um, we're just gonna turn time over to Gary Hill. And Gary, you have like five minutes, so, oh, excuse me, it's an hour. <laughs> All right, well, thanks, Mr. Mayor and the council. It's good to be back tonight and uh, we have a little bit of time tonight to review the results of the survey that was performed by Y2 Analytics. And uh, it, uh, it was an interesting process. And uh, I think, as you know, it started out with, a, uh, with a, a focus group, two different focus groups, actually, that helped sort of help us understand what questions would be appropriate to ask and, and which would get at the core issues that you were interested in getting at. And then following the focus groups, there was a survey that was administered. And I believe there were something in the range of, and we have Danny Kowser here from Y2 and Kyrene Gibb will be here shortly to talk to, but I think we sent out in the, in the range of 10,000 invitations and ha ended up having 600 or so. Thank you. Respondents. Um, and, uh, and the results were pretty interesting. Um, I think both, I was able to participate from a distance uh, with the focus groups and watch that process. And it was, it was interesting to see how similar the results were in the survey to the focus group. But uh, what we're gonna do is turn the time over to Y2 Analytics and let them walk us through the detailed results. And I'm assuming um, Danny and Kyrene that as you walk through the results that the council is welcome to stop you and ask questions as we go. Is that is that is that okay? Yeah, we're working with your five minutes council products right now. We're trying to get a thumb right because the presentation up so <laughs> see. Chief Gary, what is the bias? It rubbed it uh, my bias rubbed off apparently. I apologize. Well, I don't really have a bias more of a Is it preference. Gary's fault that Apple doesn't like anybody else to use their products? <laughs> <laughs> it must be. Is that your fault now? I think it's personal. I think it's because of software that Apple has developed so they can be <laughs> alone in everything. Yes, that's Look, also like I have an iPhone. I'm not trying to just trash them for no reason. <laughs> they just don't want to play with other people. An analogy for life there. We're going to see there if this go. loads like we need it to. Um, you Council, I think you, you everyone got a copy of both the, well, there should have been three total documents that you received a copy of. One was the summary results of the focus group. One was the top line results of the survey. And then a link was sent out this morning by me to the presentation tonight. Has everybody seen those or at least had access to them? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So if not, you can let me know and I can make sure to get those in your hands. <laughs> nah. It's MacArthur. It's for MacArthur. I'm sure. All right. Getting closer. It's amazing. A Renaissance man. Yes.
I guess while we're grappling with the technical difficulties here, I'll just go ahead and do a quick review of our survey methodology and how we got here. So Gary mentioned we conducted our focus groups and that helped inform the contours of the survey design. Um, our survey, we sent invitations to likely voters throughout our survey. So um, rather than you it is on. I will just get a little bit closer. Uh, so rather than sampling all Bountiful residents and uh, hoping that we can narrow it down to people who are likely to participate in the election, uh, we took a sample from the registered voter file and more focused than that, took a sample of likely voters throughout the city. Perfect. Uh, so that includes uh, creating a model of likely voters turnout that's based on their past participation and some other factors that we know on the registered voter file are highly correlated with likelihood to vote. Um, and most of that tends to be reliant on historical behavior. That turns out to be a much better predictor of someone's likelihood to participate in an election than their own guess of whether they say they're likely to vote. So, um, so our sample is uh, bountiful residents who are likely to vote. Uh, we sent survey invitations to nearly 11,000 households and had just shy of 900 likely voters respond. So that 8% response rate is pretty good as far as standard survey research uh, response rates are concerned. Uh, it's significantly better than what we see on most phone surveys. So uh, as disheartening as that may seem, that's my line of work. Um, we're looking at about a 13 minute average length of interview. So not a lot of time, but I think it, there's some clear evidence here that bountiful voters who responded to the survey were paying careful attention and uh, internalized the information that we presented to them throughout the course of the survey. Um, our 873 interviews result in a margin of error of 3.3 percentage points, roughly. So we're pretty confident in the accuracy of these results and how they represent the likely electorate. Um, so we're going to start with a few key takeaways here. Uh, first of all, likely voters citywide are generally pleased with the city of Bountiful. And I think that's important context to have in mind. So 78% say that the city is headed in the right direction. And most residents are happy with the parks and recreational amenities that the city currently provides. Uh, when we look at our different bond proposals, the second key takeaway here, voters are equally supportive of the $6 million and $8 million bond proposals. Um, so without any additional information off the cuff, there are no statistical differences between those two bond amounts or the tax impacts in terms of how they affect likely voter support. Um, when we look at sort of post hoc, those voters who saw the $6 million bond ballot and asked them if they would be more or less likely to support a bond that included funding for trails, most say that they would uh, appreciate that inclusion or would be more likely to vote for that version of the bond. So I think there's some evidence here that there's not a lot of price sensitivity at this particular level. So when we're looking at six and $8 million, the household impact differences aren't large enough that we're, we're seeing a statistically significant difference there. Our third key takeaway focuses on the reasons why those residents who said they would not support a bond indicated that they would be opposed. And most of those hinge on the tax impact. So I think unsurprisingly, the cost is the biggest issue or the hurdle that we would be facing. Um, there were very few concerns about the COVID-19 pandemic and sort of the timing of the bond, which I know we talked early on in this process about whether or not that was something that we should be taking into consideration. And while I think it's critical that we be sensitive to those concerns and reassure voters that this is something that the city has been deliberate about in their thought process, um, that doesn't seem to be a reason not to move forward in voters' minds. Only 2% of those who opposed either bond amount uh, mentioned COVID-19 at all. So the uh, fourth key takeaway here, providing a clear plan for how the bond funds will be used and evidence that Bountiful uses money wisely are the two most important messages or arguments in favor of a bond that persuade voters to support a general obligation bond. So we went through a battery of 
arguments in favor or supporting information. And those were the things that stood out the most as important to voters. And then the last key takeaway here, helping residents understand that there is a limited window of time in which the city can purchase the land from the school district is also important. Um, doing this while maintaining confidence that the city isn't making a rushed decision is critical. So I think the one two punch here is we have a clear plan. This has been very well thought through, but this is our window of opportunity. So if there's an interest in moving forward, that's really the path for mitigating any opposition or most opposition. And so taking a deep dive into all of these things now, looking at the current climate of the city, um, most voters say that Bountiful has stayed about the same in the last five years. So 46% say that the city is about the same. 28% say the city has gotten better. Only 20% say the city has gotten worse in the last five years. 6% of our registered voters say they haven't been here long enough to make that five-year comparison. Um, but it is good to look at this sort of pretty normal distribution, but see that the momentum has shifted in a positive direction. So uh, those positive responses or those responses that say the city has gotten better outweigh those negative responses. Uh, similarly, when we asked residents whether they thought the city uh, was headed in the right direction or the wrong direction, 78% said the city was headed in the right direction. Uh, we also asked just a couple introductory questions to help get residents thinking about recreational amenities in the city and ask them how satisfied or dissatisfied they are overall with the value their household receives from parks, trails, open spaces, and sports fields in Bountiful. 69%, so just over two thirds, said that they were very or somewhat satisfied. Only 13% were to some degree dissatisfied. Uh, and then when we asked, to what extent do you agree or disagree with this statement? Bountiful City currently provides an adequate number of parks, recreation, open space, and trails opportunities. Two thirds, again, agree with that sentiment. 21% disagree with that sentiment, which is a little bit higher than those who are dissatisfied with the recreational amenities. So I think that indicates that there is you know, a little bit of room for improvement here in residents' minds. They're happy with what they have, but there's, they don't want to say that we have enough. What is enough? Um, I think that's difficult to quantify sometimes. So, uh, We asked residents what types of activities they participate in outdoors as well, so that we could use this as a lens for subsequent analysis of our voters to see if there were patterns of behavior or preferences among those who are most active in using these recreational amenities. 76% um, of residents say that they participate in trail activities. 42% say that they participate in swimming or water activities, 30% court sports, and 29% field sports. Uh, so I think that, that is helpful context as we're looking at some of the bond support numbers and those constituencies. Um, we also asked just an open-ended question before we went into any details about a potential bond proposal to see what residents may have recently seen, read, or heard about sports parks, fields, and trails in the city. Um, you'll notice the big center of this word cloud is nothing. That's not something that's on many residents' minds. Um, but there are a lot of sort of loosely connected themes here. Um, pickleball jumps off the screen for me. I think that's something that I see in every city. Um, State park is there. But many people, a lot of comments about increased participation in outdoor activities in the wake of COVID-19. Um, and then Bountiful has a lot of trails, needs more courts. Um, but then a lot of people saying that they just nothing really came to mind where they don't have enough context or information to provide an informed answer here. So looking at our bond proposals now, um, I want to just show these potential proposition language versions on the screen side by side briefly so that you can see uh, sort of the setup of our survey experiment here. So voters were randomly assigned to see just one of these two propositions. So rather than having them weigh against one another, the $6 million and $8 million bond, we wanted to see if there were statistically significant differences between support and opposition for each different amount. So half of our survey respondents saw the $6 million bond there on the left side of the screen. Half of our respondents were randomly assigned to see the $8 million bond language and household tax impact on the right side of the screen. And you'll notice 
that the household tax impact difference, I think that difference being only about $8 per year is the key indicator of why we're not seeing statistically significant differences here. Um, that household tax impact number is a lot easier to translate and internalize. And when we're looking at a pretty minimal difference in terms of the annual impact, I, I would have been surprised to see strong or dramatic effects or differences between the two uh, language options. Um, so as I mentioned, there was no significant difference in support. Uh, we saw 54% of voters started out without any additional information beyond the ballot language or potential ballot language in support of a $6 million bond and 53% start out in support of a potential $8 million bond. Um, we have 32% and 33% who start out against without any additional information, and then 15% and 14% who are reluctant to stake a claim, just looking at the bond language, they want to know more before they make their decision. Um, looking at the $6 million bond proposal first, and some of the differences in support <coughs> constituencies of voters that we have here. When we look at, again, this initial ballot question before we presented any additional information, uh, women are more likely to be in support of the bond without any further information than are men. Uh, men are roughly 10 percentage points more likely to oppose a bond uh, without any additional information. Um, women are slightly more likely to indicate that they need more information to make their decision. Um, there's also an age difference here. So those voters who are 55 and older in the city are more likely to be, say that they are definitely against a bond than are those who are younger than 55. So we see that 10 percentage point gap here in definite op opposition before we present any additional information throughout the survey. Um, so we asked voters initially why they would either support or oppose a potential bond measure. Um, the need for recreation facilities was the most commonly mentioned reason to support a bond, uh, followed closely by the need for more green or open space. So the general idea that we need more parks to maintain our quality of life in the city was a common theme here. Um, there were also some additional themes being opposed to alternate types of development that may occur at the site, um, general improvement of quality of life in the city and, and preserving property values, building a healthy community. Um, a lot of these things I think tie in together quite well. And when we look at the idea that this potential bond would address the need for parks and specifically field space in the city, 7% uh, of voters who would support a bond mentioned that specifically as well. Um, when we look at reasons that voters would oppose this $6 million bond proposal, 17% just cited opposition to higher taxes generally. So the idea that any tax impact is too much tax impact um, is our most common sentiment. 12% of voters said that they felt this was an unnecessary proposal. Um, and then a few uh, sort of long tail of other options here that fit in, but better uses for land or money, uh, no personal benefit, 3% of those who would be opposed initially said that they didn't see how it would benefit them specifically. And uh, again, only 2% mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, our focus groups brought up some interesting counter arguments to that sentiment that we just wanted to plug briefly here. Um, we had a few residents in our focus groups who felt that if we, Put our lives on pause and stop making any plans for the future because we're dealing with this pandemic now. We're being very short-sighted and so the idea here and this quote that we pulled directly from those focus groups was this will eventually pass and we can't stop moving forward with other projects just because something bad is happening now. So that was um, a very, a very <clears throat> articulate quote that we pulled and, and latched on to um, just as a potential response to this sentiment um, which was more of a fringe sentiment than we anticipated. Um, so looking at the, the potential for including trail funding after the fact, uh, again, this is those residents who saw the $6 million bond, so there was no trail funding included in that bond language. 
Um, we asked them directly whether they would be more or less likely to support the bond if it included funding to expand and make improvements to the Bountiful City Trail System. And 53% said they would be more likely. 29% uh, said that it wouldn't change their vote. They would neither be more or less likely. And 19% said it would make them somewhat or a lot less likely to support. So there is a group that feels alienated by the inclusion of trails funding, but on the whole, it is either not a consideration or a positive consideration for the majority of voters. Uh, looking now at the $8 million bond proposal, this is the one that included the funding for trail improvements. Um, interestingly, so our definitely against constituency among men is significantly higher than that for among women. Um, again, before we go through any additional information about bond, just reacting to that ballot language. Um, so that's an eight percentage point difference, or an eight percentage point declaration of definite opposition among women and a 22 percentage point a definite opposition to a bond among men before seeing any additional information to the bond. Um, the thing that we wanted to highlight here is that we really gain traction among our trail users when there's inclusion for trail funding. So 32% say that they would definitely vote for the bond. And this is anyone who uses trails at least once a month. Um, and you'll recall from the slide a few slides back, that's a large proportion of our city residents, so, or of our city likely voters rather. Uh, Non-trail users, 49% in total say that they would probably or definitely support a bond measure, uh, but only 13% say they would definitely support. So there are definitely some activity considerations and sort of use case constituencies here. Uh, looking again at the major themes or reasons for support and opposition, 23% of likely voters said that they felt that this was a worthwhile investment. So whether that was for the city and quality of life or um, just the need to invest in parks and open space generally, um, those were sort of our major support themes here. 3% um, were opposed to alternate types of development, and 3% said that it was conveniently located. So that's a good reason to put parks and field space there. Um, looking at reasons why those who saw the $8 million bond proposal would oppose such a proposal, again, that largest theme and constituency here is just the opposition to higher taxes, generally speaking. Um, these numbers are pretty similar to what you would see for any tax proposal. By the way, about a fifth of likely voters being staunchly opposed to any tax increase that's on the ballot, um, regardless of, of what that tax increase is dedicated to, is what we're used to seeing. Somewhere between a fifth and a quarter is right about spot on for this part of the Wasatch Front. Um, so we asked residents or voters who I saw each of these ballot questions, what additional information they would like to see to help them make a decision on how to vote. And this question was presented to all of the voters who reacted to each ballot question, not just those who said that they needed additional information, because we wanted to get a sense of what considerations were key as voters are deliberating. Um, so you'll see here, this is um, a word cloud again, the size of the word corresponds to the frequency with which it was mentioned. Um, but we pulled out a few verbatim quotes here because I think it's difficult to pull these apart sometimes. Um, so some of the interesting and illustrative things that we saw in these open-ended responses. I'd like to see the plans for the development and know what would happen to the land if the park was not approved. So what are the alternatives that we're facing and what is the city's proposal specifically for this piece of land? Um, would this increase taxes and by how much? That's included in the bond language, but this is something that we have to be really explicit about because it gets lost in the legal ballot language. Legal jargon is difficult to decipher, and so that theme popping up um, is not surprising, and I think something that we have to be careful communicating about any time that we're considering a ballot proposition. And then the last quote here, I would like to know the estimated dates and timelines that trails specifically, but also parks and courts would get completed. So the idea that residents are hungry for details and that the details of the proposals matter, I think is something that shines through throughout the survey responses. 
And so looking at some of the messaging strategies and the arguments in favor of a bond that were presented to voters. Um, and there were a few nuanced differences in some of these arguments. Um, the messages are detailed in full in an appendix and you saw those in the top line results as well. So I'm not gonna go through each of these individually and read the wording explicitly. I'm happy to jump to um, specific messages if there are questions. The thing that I wanna look at is how these messages relate to one another, sorry, in terms of persuasiveness and importance to voters as they're making their decisions. So the number one most important message as uh, according to voters self-report is that there's a clear plan for bond funds. So that the city has an idea of how this money would be used and that residents would be involved in the planning process. That's a really compelling piece of information that's really assuring to many voters. So 42% of voters said that that piece of information was extremely important to them in their decision-making process. 41% uh, of voters said that the fact that Bountiful uses money wisely and is not currently in debt was very, was extremely important to them. Another 34% said that it was very important. Um, making that the most um, compelling message overall. So 75%, three out of four voters said that Bountiful using money wisely and the context around the city's current lack of debt and strong bond rating was a key piece of information for their decision-making process. Um, the message about avoiding potential development there and what that could look like if the city did not purchase the space was extremely important to 38% of voters. Um, message that focused on preserving green space and adding to quality of life in the community while that green space is available was also extremely important to 38% of voters. Um, this message about the bond being a worthwhile investment and benefiting residents throughout the community was extremely important to just under a third of our voters. Uh, and then the message about fiscal responsibility is the only one that there were some just slight differences between our $6 million and $8 million bond amounts. Um, but again, these differences are not statistically significant anywhere here. So um, the fiscal responsibility message uh, was also important to about a quarter of voters and then the address demand for fields message. So when we're looking at field space specifically and the demand for that in the city, 26% of voters said that that was extremely important. But I think there's a pretty clear hierarchy here um, that helps guide a potential information campaign and a messaging strategy for the city. Um, so this is looking at perceptions among all voters. Um, when we look at messages that persuade those voters who um, change their position throughout the course of the survey after reading information, um, that stacks up just a little bit differently. So when we look at the $6 million bond proposal and the messages that persuaded voters to support that proposal, um, addressing the need for playing fields, so identifying that there's a clear need to acquire this space, not just that we have a plan for it, not just that it would be nice, but that it's addressing a need for something that residents have expressed in the city, that was a very persuasive message, even though it wasn't expressed as the most important message as voters were evaluating them individually. Um, avoiding alternate development was another message that was very persuasive, really compelling, um, not necessarily as highly rated in terms of individual importance, but very important for persuading voters who might be on the and then the initial support level here. So this is just to look at movement. Um, initial support level is usually pretty indicative of how someone lands and in an informed ballot. Um, it's showing that there are messages that are more important in determining the outcome of a post ballot or an informed ballot uh, than the initial support level or more highly correlated with their post ballot position then that initial support level actually means that the city has some really compelling persuasive information here that moves voters. So that's just something that I wanted to highlight for the $6 million bond proposal. Um, everything in this top box had a positive persuasion score. So all of these messages were likely to move voters in a positive direction before that final ballot question, and we'll get to that. Um, these two factors here, so the message about Bountiful using money wisely actually was not persuasive 
while it was important to voters. So again, um, a lot of information to digest here, but I think it's clear that those voters who are in your camp are really happy to hear that you're using money wisely. Those who are on the fence aren't persuaded by just that. Um, and then we also controlled for households with children and residents' income. Um, income is slightly negatively correlated with bond support, which is interesting. Um, and then the clear plan for bond funds was also slightly negative, not statistically significant at the highest threshold, um, but that message wasn't one that was persuasive. It was important to supporters of the bond and those who were against the bond or maybe on the fence, uh, that one wasn't correlated with positive movement. So um, interesting because the clear plan is so key in establishing the need for the field space and addressing that need. Uh, but so it, it, I want to just clearly break down that it matters who you're talking to and how you're talking to them. There's not one messaging strategy for all voters throughout the city. Can I ask you a question? Yes, right absolutely. So, so you know, you've said how important it was in another in the other graph about people want to know exactly what is going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that there is there's some reticence in the city to give too many specific kinds of things that obligate you uh, to the to the public because things change. I right. mean, uh, it could be 2008 and we have a recession and we don't have the money for this or that, but making promises, very specific ones, mm -hmm. is difficult. So although it's super important to what they want, there are some negatives to that. You, you've done this with other cities. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen cities that have been very, very specific about the things they're going to use that money for and some that have been a little more uh, quiet about exactly what they're going to do? and and was the voting, did it change the voting? So I will say that the, the worst thing you can do is go out without a plan. So voters want to know that this isn't something that was hastily decided or something that the city um, felt that they could spend or raise money for on a whim without a clear need. So I think the details that are the most critical and where I've seen the most success are those that tie the need to the expense. So um, without, without tying the city's hands, without saying this is exactly what this will look like, the things that I think we do want to ensure that we're clearly communicating are this is why the city thinks this is important and this is what this could look like. This is what our planning process will look like as we're moving forward with this, if this is something that the city decides to do. So that residents know that there is a plan, things change, and usually voters are, are pretty understanding of that. They want to make sure that the city is being fiscally responsible and prudent with taxpayer dollars. Um, but to ensure that there is a plan and that this isn't just a, a whim um, is the key. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a few differences here in the persuasive messages for that $8 million bond proposal. But again, pretty similar themes overall. So the idea of avoiding alternative development, fiscal responsibility, being a worthwhile investment that will benefit a variety of community members, and addressing the need for playing fields were all positively correlated with support for the bond after reading these messages. Um, and then preserving green space was the last one that just barely uh, makes positive correlation here. Um, so looking at how support shifts from before and after the information presented to voters, and I want to caveat this by saying that this is a rose-colored glasses view of final bond support. So this is what we would expect the outcome of the election to look like if there were no opposition sentiments um, broadly expressed, if there was no negative campaign or anti-bond information. We would expect things to shake out like this post ballot. Um, but in the face of realistic campaigning and our 25 to 30% of voters who are maybe a little bit more staunchly opposed to tax increases, um, I think 
it's, it's easy to make a no argument for most bonds. So again, that's, this is where the clear plan and clear information from the city come into play. But I would say, don't bank on a bond coming out 72% in favor. I will say that this 18 points in positive movement from the initial just ballot language reaction to our, what we would call the informed ballot after all of our messaging in favor of a bond is a good indicator that the messages that the city has identified that we tested in the survey are important considerations for voters and that they are positively correlated with support for a bond. So uh, again, I don't wanna promise that this bond would pass with 72% of the vote, but I do think that this indicates that the city is very well positioned to succeed in this bond effort if that's what the council and mayor decide to do. Um, looking at how this group who said they don't know and needed more information split specifically after reading through all of those messages, 70% said that they would probably vote for the bond after reading the arguments in favor, and 13% said they would definitely vote for. So that's four out of five voters saying who initially were reluctant to give us an answer either way, who said they wanted more information. Once they were presented with more information, the vast majority uh, voted in favor of that $6 million proposal. Um, when we look at the constituencies of support and sort of our persuadable audience and our opposition here, um, we have 18% of voters who were our firm support throughout the entire survey, 17% who were completely convinced by the information of the survey, even if they started out maybe on the fence or in the middle of the road. Um, and then we have 34% who lean towards supporting, but are, are not completely convinced. We call that our soft support category. Um, and you'll see that makes up a large portion of our support. But when we see this post messaging ballot where we have more strong support than soft support, that's pretty reassuring. Um, so again, a pretty strong case here for a successful um, potential bond environment. Um, we have 22% who are staunchly opposed, and if anything, the survey information makes it worse. Um, and again, that's pretty highly correlated with just our anti-tax all the time sentiment residents. Um, I think those voters play a very important role in ensuring that we're being fiscally responsible all the time, um, but it would be very difficult to win them over for any bond proposal. Um, and then our soft opposition category is about 9% of likely voters for that $6 million bond. Um, similarly, our $8 million bond proposal, we go from 21% saying they would definitely vote for the bond to 33% saying they would definitely vote for, and 34% saying they would probably vote for to 42% saying they would probably vote for. And um, that's an increase in 20, of 20 percentage points in total support. So again, really positive movement here. And when we look at that, particular don't know, need more information group, 77% say they would probably vote for the bond after all of the messages, 9% say they would definitely vote for, and we didn't have anyone saying that they would definitely vote against the bond after seeing those positive messages. Um, again, our support, persuasion, and opposition sort of constituencies here, 18% firm support throughout the survey, 13% completely convinced, by the information in the survey, 40% who are our soft support category, um, and then 11% are, are skeptics, uh, and 18% pretty strong opposition there. Um, we asked voters to just indicate to us what the most important or most memorable piece of information they had seen in the survey was. Um, some of the call outs here, the fact that the city has a limited window of time to buy this space from the school district for a proposed park or recreation area. Um, another, a potential tax increase for something we don't need. So we wanted to present both sides of the coin here. Um, and then I totally agree we need to protect our open space. I'm just wary about more taxes. Um, I think this is the full spectrum of potential support and opposition arguments when, we're, when you're looking at an informed electorate. When you're looking at here are all of the facts on the table, um, seeing how all of this shakes out and the pieces of information that are key to voters 
um, it's important to have a message that speaks directly to each of these potential concerns. And then the last thing I want to go over here a little bit is just some trail considerations. So we did ask how often residents use or visit Bountiful City trails if they indicated that trail activities were something they participated in. 27% um, say that they use trails a few times a month or more, 13% about once a month, 32% a few times a year. 20% of voters said that they never use or visit Bountiful City trails and we asked why or why not rather. 40% um, said they're not interested in hiking, 19% said they have lack information about trail availability. 33% uh, mentioned some other uh, unlisted answer and those included age-related disabilities or health concerns and limitations. So uh, that 20% of our constituents who do not use city trails is about the same as the uh, constituency that we see who are pretty opposed to the bond. Uh, and again, looking back, I won't go all the way back up, it's hard to jump around, um, but looking back at our sort of constituencies and the subgroup breakdown of support, trail users are a lot more likely to support the bond endeavor than non-trail users. Um, that said, most residents or most likely voters expressed interest in this bond proposal because of the value it added to the community and the preservation of green space. Um, when we asked voters whether they would prefer to see the city expand the trail system or improve existing trails, this is a really rare finding in survey research. So I, wanna, I wanted to put this up on the slide. Likely voters in the city of Bountiful were evenly split 50-50 between expanding and improving the trail system. Um, I never see a perfect 50-50 split, so that was fun for me. Um, but we did want to dive in a little bit and see what our constituencies of support were here. So when we look at active residents, and that should actually be active trail users, 64% um, would like to see the trail system expanded. Those who use trails less frequently or not at all are more interested in seeing improvements to existing trails. Similarly, seniors are more likely to say that they would like to see improvements to existing trails, while residents less, who are 55 or under 55 years of age, 62%, uh, so nearly two thirds, say that they would prefer to see the trail system expanded. Uh, those households with children at home, 64% say they would prefer to see expansions to the trail system. Those without kids at home, 57% would prefer to see improvements to existing trails. So, some interesting subgroup uh, considerations here, but again, I think the fact that the city overall was evenly divided uh, means that there's some trails master planning to reference here and hopefully everyone gets a little bit of what they want. Um, and then we had some analysis of which trails were most frequently visited. I'm gonna just gloss over this really quickly. We asked about trail maintenance as well. Um, most trails were, viewed as mostly well-maintained. Uh, Bonneville Shoreline Trail and Elephant Rock Trail were the most likely to be perceived as very well-maintained by their respective users. Um, the Highland Oaks Trail is used by a smaller proportion of residents, whether that means that fewer people know it as the Highland Oaks Trail or just significantly fewer people use it uh, is questionable for me. I don't know that I know the names of all of the trails I use, um, but among those who do use the Highland Oaks Trail, it was very highly rated as a well-maintained trail. And we asked a question about what specific improvements residents would like to see at each trail. And so this is a lot of data and we wanted to try and get it onto one slide that was a little bit easier to digest than just a bunch of numbers for each trail. Um, so the size of the bubble associated with each trail is correlated to the proportion of residents who would like to see that particular improvement at the trail. Um, so the things that stood out the most, um, increased parking, new or improved restroom facilities, and new benches or seating are among the most commonly requested improvements across trails, um, followed for m many of the trails we tested by a need for clearing brush and rocks. Um, users of North Canyon Trail are more likely than other trails to say that 
increased accessibility at the trailhead is needed. And then uh, Temple Ridge and Bonneville Shoreline Trail users were the most likely to say that there were none, that none of these improvements were particularly needed, which I think is pretty consistent with our maintenance ratings on the previous slide. Uh, there's a full appendix of respondent demographic composition and again the explicit wording of each of the messages that we tested in the survey. Um, I am most interested in addressing any questions that have come up and then I'll let you peruse that information in the appendix and send any follow-up requests my way if that would be helpful. Um, I would just like to say this has been so interesting and I think it's fair to say that this in many ways represents both sides of the argument. Those who are for the, the bond and those who are against the bond. So I feel like it was a very um, wise move on the part of the city to do this research that it will help us move forward in a more deliberate manner. So I hope so. Thank you. Yeah. Well done. Any questions or comments? I'm happy to stay up here if that's helpful, but otherwise I will turn the time back to you. Back to you, back to you Gary. I don't have anything else, Thank Council. Thank you very much. Appreciated working with. So I don't have any other information. Um, we have a few minutes before, so we could take a break if you like. And um, and then folks that they have questions, they can come up and ask us yeah, if you'd like to. And and, uh, and then we'll uh, reconvene at seven. Okay, let's let's take a break. There's already there's also a con a comment time at the beginning of our.